Welcome to the Troutman Sanders Battery and Storage Podcast. I'm your co-host, Cliff Sikora. And I'm Bill Durasmo. In this podcast, we will interview battery and storage experts, industry thought leaders, Cliff. We want you to hear the unique perspectives that we hear from industry veterans and how they're deploying this new and very exciting technology into an industry that wasn't particularly exciting for most folks just several years ago. But you know, the focus of this podcast is going to be on the people, the thought leadership. We're not necessarily going to get into the weeds on technical issues, but we're going to focus on the transformation of the resource fleet and how storage fits within that transformation. We're going to get into some of the cutting edge regulatory and policy issues. We're going to talk a little bit about how you finance and deploy these assets, how you seek cost recovery. Are you going to look at on balance sheet or off balance sheet? We're going to talk about some of the planning issues associated with these devices. And in addition, there are numerous issues associated with operating storage resources once they are deployed. What sort of products can they provide? How will those products be priced? Will they be priced in front of the meter? Will they be priced in back of the meter? Will the two dovetail with one another? What is the future of solar plus storage, microgrids, and environmental issues? On the surface, one might say that batteries are an environmental benefit, but not necessarily. Accordingly, we look forward to bringing you thought leaders, folks who have been in the industry for many years and are dealing with an assumption change, a major transformational change regarding the physics of the business. Electricity can now be stored. This is an exciting time. We hope you join us. Welcome to the Troutman Sanders Battery and Storage Podcast. And we are very, very honored this morning to have with us a guest, Matty Stanislaus, who is the interim director of the Global Battery Alliance. He is also um, working with the World Economic Forum as well as the World Resource Institute. He was assistant administrator for the EPA's Office of Land Emergency Management in the Obama administration. He's got a law degree um, with an environmental law concentration from Chicago, Kent. And in addition, he has an engineering degree in chemical engineering with a specialization in materials science from the City College of New York. Welcome, Matty. How are you this morning? I'm good. How are you doing? Great, great. Thank you for being on the pod. I'd also like to introduce my partner, Bill Durasmo. Good morning. Bill and I will be interviewing Maddie. And um, Maddie, to start off, um, tell us a little bit about the Global Battery Alliance and how your work with that organization fits into um, both the World Economic Forum and the World Resource Institute. Sure. Uh, so the Global Battery Alliance is hosted by the World Economic Forum. It is a public-private platform. Uh, it, ha- it consists of, um, from the private side, representatives from every facet of the value chain. Uh, we have mining companies, uh, mineral processing companies, automobile companies, uh, battery companies, and a few technology companies also. Um, we also have uh, in the public sector governments and NGOs, uh, some of them who do work in terms of uh, the, the, the sourcing issues, the human rights issues, uh, and some looking at uh, the further deployment of energy uh, throughout the globe. Uh, so the Global Battery Alliance, it has three main pillars. Uh, the one is to address the sourcing issues in a way that eliminates uh, human rights violations, particularly child labor and forced labor. Uh, the second is a circular economy pillar uh, that looks at how do you actually create more of a circular system Uh, Things like life extension, second life of batteries, and optimizing recycling. And the third pillar is to uh, accelerate the deployment 
the access to energy uh, to populations that currently do not have energy, which is estimated to be about 850 uh, million people currently. Wow. So to to, to back up a minute, um, the bottom line here being batteries are um, a vehicle from a worldwide perspective to get um, economies um, moving, started, as well as do it in a sustainable way. However, I think what you're pointing out is that there are a number of different externalities associated with battery production, with battery rollout, with making that part of a global sustainable future um, a reality. It may itself have problems that we need to fix. It sounds as if what you're saying is you're getting in front of that with this group. Is that right? Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, so, uh, I mean, batteries has gone from this uh, kind of perception of the truly a, a portable, you know, uh, a- energy uh, in electronic products to be a main driver uh, for the, the, the shift in transportation, uh, uh, acceleration and uh, of renewable energy deployment. Um, uh, so, you know, w- current estimates are that the energy market, the battery market is going to increase uh, 13-fold, roughly, uh, by 2030. Uh, so the question is, how do you uh, look at that ex- uh, market acceleration in a way that builds in uh, 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 the integration of human rights issues as well as environmental issues and to really make Barry a driver uh, the, for the achievement, for example, of the Paris goals uh, while integrating kind of human rights issues. Right. So um, talk a little bit about those human rights issues because I think um, the U.S. is, you know, right on the cusp of a rollout of battery technology and the electric systems um, both at the distribution level, the transmission level, there's renewable. And so I think from, from the U.S. perspective, I would like our audience to really understand kind of some of the problems that are going on out there in the rest of the world. So if you could give us a little background on that. Yeah. Uh, so let me focus on cobalt. Uh, so the cobalt is, is, a, is currently a, a primary uh, uh, material for the production of uh, lithium-ion batteries. Uh, so, uh, in the forecast, in the growth forecast of batteries, we're going to have to double that production by 2030. Uh, but the problem is that about 75, 70, about 70% of cobalt currently comes from, uh, the, the Congo, uh, Democratic Republic of Congo. And a substantial portion of that. Uh, is done through artisanal mining, um, and so child labor is involved substantially. Um, I mean, we don't know precisely the number of children that are involved, but children are uh, very much involved in the production of, of cobalt. Uh, so, I mean, that's the reality. And so uh, this effort is to, how do you, how do you transition uh, uh, for both uh, a alternative livelihood uh, for those communities while producing cobalt uh, and other minerals uh, in a way that doesn't uh, violate human rights uh, uh, requirements, human rights conditions. Right. So is this a Congo problem or is it w- widespread beyond that? Or where, where else in the world are we harvesting cobalt? Well, you know, cobalt, uh, you know, 70% uh, of it currently is in uh, the Congo. And then we have uh, cobalt uh, primary and dispersed throughout the globe. I I would say in these two ways, um, you have to look at it from a value chain perspective, right? So cobalt is mined and processed in various other countries in terms of the initial processing and gets embedded into the product. So I would say the entire value chain has ownership and responsibility of the social and human rights issues. 
So I think, frankly, the, the historic problem has been to look at it, well, that's just a mining issue. Well, it's not just a mining issue. Um, if that material is embedded throughout society, right? So I think the view is the entire value chain has to take responsibility for it uh, in terms of transparency, in terms of accountability, uh, and to drive that up and down the value chain if we're going to really have a value chain that eliminates its human rights conditions. You know? And I think in, a, in the era of data, uh, frankly, there's no excuse for – uh, either an entity far up in the value chain or the consumer or governments to say, but there's no way for us to know and there's no way for us to drive accountability. Right. So part of the the goals then of the Global Battery Alliance is to work at all um, links in that value chain, so to speak, um, to make uh, an, an awareness of this issue and to put protocols in place, it sounds like, to – work toward a fair and free uh, trade in this area um, is that – talk talk to us a little bit about how you're going to reach out to those various links in the value chain. Well, I mean the fact is we have those links of the value chain at the table, right? So we have mining companies. We have NGOs who do work on the ground uh, organizing um, – uh, the, the workforce and, frankly, working with children who are working in that. So it's a complex problem of both setting up um, certification schemes, uh, setting up accountability schemes, uh, but also recognizing you need, to, you need to also set up schemes to transition uh, the livelihood. This, this is a family livelihood to alternative livelihood. So it's a really complex uh, issue. So we have enough far upstream those players we have you know the chemical companies and the mineral processing companies we have battery companies uh and automobile companies so getting all around the table and then looking at well how do we the collective work together to uh highlight one not only the problem but what are ways of solving that problem so uh, adherence and compliance with standards, uh, looking at transparency throughout the, 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 the value chain uh, and how uh, the various entities from uh, very high up in the, in the value chain to the very far down in the value chain can better align and have a common set of, of information, uh, of data uh, for which it holds uh, everyone accountable to that, that same set. Of, of standards. So from, you know, one of our or many of our clients' perspectives or folks that we deal with and stakeholders in the electricity business, if I was somebody who was interested in um, buying, you know, a bunch of batteries because I, I saw an opportunity in that area, but and I was also concerned about some of the issues that, that your group is concerned about, what should I do today? Is there something I can do today to make sure that my footprint isn't um, big, bad, and ugly, um, or is it, hey, let's get with Maggie's program and see if we can work? Um, is there something I can do today, or is, in other words, you're pointing out a serious problem that we all need to work on? Well, I mean, I, I would say uh, I would say two things. I, mean, I think every uh, entity uh, in the value chain uh, should recognize the need uh, in a very voiceful way to address child labor and human rights violations uh, in the supply chain, right? Um, so that's the first thing I will say is recognizing that the 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 the, the sourcing of materials comes with problems, and that we're committed to work to address that. Uh, but we're committed to work with others in a pre-competitive mode to begin solving that. Uh, a commitment to it. One, adherence to existing standards and improving standards when they, where they may be necessary. Um, the other thing I will do is, is uh, establish an expectation and accountability through the value chain uh, of, uh, of, of, you know, the, call it principles, call it uh, a commitment. I, I think that will begin uh, sending, uh, I would say, uh, the accountability uh, uh, to the market 
that this is a serious problem and be it the purchasers or users are are committed to addressing that problem. And Mati, this is this is Bill. And I'll just jump in. You know, as the U.S. markets roll out um, programs for uh, two-way battery participation and the batteries, grid-scale batteries penetrate the sector with various usage types, you know, how can market participants get involved in making sure there is awareness and recognition of the Global Battery Alliance's goals? And things are moving so fast with market penetration. Um, so th- this this stuff is coming uh, quickly. So if you could just speak to that, I think it'd be helpful. So um, I-, I would say that uh, I think uh, joining uh, uh, the Global Battery Alliance, uh, either as a full member uh, or in terms of the working group activities, we have working groups that focus in on the, the circular economy side. Uh, uh, we have working groups focusing on the cobalt side and the energy deployment side. Uh, and just briefly, you know, the, I mentioned the cobalt, um, looking at, you know, building transparency and accountability, but that's still a work in progress. So I think joining and providing perspectives on how to best do that, I think it'd be helpful. Uh, circular economy, we're looking at a multiple of things to accelerate circular economy, including transboundary regulations, uh, creating a data exchange platform. So I think potentially participating in those activities and bringing their insights to the table. You know, so that that's kind of, a, I would say, an operational level. I, I think the other, other thing is just to highlight I mean, both the, 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 the challenge and the opportunities of batteries, right? So I, I think um, and uh, in, uh, in New York in uh, September, we're going to be rolling out this roadmap for a sustainable battery value chain, which is going to link the market demand growth, 13x, uh, to... How do, how, do we, how do we collectively meet that demand by embedding and integrating sustainability? So I think paying attention to that and ideally uh, um, uh, agreeing to kind of the vision of a sustainable value chain that's going to be articulated uh, in September will be some of the things that I would suggest uh, 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 your clients and uh, uh, examine. First of all, Maddie, yes, I, we were looking for you to give a crash commercial message, but um, M- Maddie is very understated as normal as usual, and um, so um, we we agree. And um, one of the reasons we wanted to host you on the show was to make sure that folks were aware of this effort uh, and um, and that it's uh, forward looking in terms of where where the markets are going. Those of us who are energy industry uh, veterans. Um, the law of unintended consequences is probably, if you were to say, you were to trace dots along the past 30 to 40 years of energy policy, I think the law of unintended consequences would be right there at the top. It's never been repealed. <laughs> <laughs> so so I think that the, the, the one thing that makes us excited about your effort is getting in front of some of the issues um, that are um, not – apparent at least to folks in in our industry here in the u.s so how can how can folks follow this effort you're saying it's going to roll out uh, in new york in september maybe you could just speak to how folks might find out more about that how they could follow it yeah um I, I, you know there is going to be a major rollout there's going to be the issuance of this roadmap and associated press releases uh you should uh can go on to the global battery alliance website uh, which uh, presents the current state uh, of information, um, and uh, you know, look at the roadmap. Uh, and if there are particular entities or clients that are interested in more either engaging uh, uh, with the Global Battery Alliance, they could uh, connect directly with with me. Uh, my con- connecting through you all uh, in, in terms of that. Yeah, l- let me kind of say uh, this, uh, which I I don't think is really well understood, that I I think batteries and energy storage is at an inflection point. Uh, 
Uh, and that inflection point is not just the, the how the market is moving. You know, that inflection point is that uh, the opportunity to batteries to be a huge multiplier of energy broadly. Right? So in the roadmap, we're going to be talking about how batteries can really scale uh, the uh, integration of renewables into the grid in a way you've never seen before. Right. So uh, and, and due to that, you know, what we're going to roll out is how batteries is going to be one of the major drivers towards achieving the Paris Agreement. Uh, so I think there's a huge opportunity that I don't think is was really well understood up until this moment. Right. And that, of course, is manifesting itself here in the States in a number of different ways with, you know, the the cost reductions of the solar plus storage product, as folks are calling it. Um, then you also see New York involved in um, goal setting for storage on New York systems. You see storage um, from policymakers' perspectives here being coupled with offshore wind, um, the two of them kind of going hand in hand. So I think here in the States, we've kind of looked at what you just said, Maddie, from an economic perspective and um, and I think what you're also alluding to is that there are global positive externality benefits associated with it as long as we watch what we're doing. Would that be the message? Yeah, and I think in terms of the U.S., where I, I, I think that um, there are opportunities to uh, align policy uh, in a more proactive way. Um, So the acceleration of battery storage for all the things uh, that I've articulated, uh, policymakers need to catch up, frankly. Uh, So there is this intersection of grid issue and the policies associated with that. Uh, So that's an issue that I think can be dealt with at a state or multi-state level. Um, There is uh, kind of barriers to the flow of uh, batteries for extent, life extension, second life, and recycling that, again, I think the U.S. rules need to catch up uh, because even among the U.S. states, there are different definitions that really gets in the way of an optimization of the market for kind of the these, again, life extension activities. Uh, so there's lots of, I think, policy areas that are ripe uh, to kind of link with uh, the battery demand that I, w- I would s- suggest that there be a focused effort to figure out what the highest priority and where is the, the, the set of governments that are more re- most receptive to addressing them. Because I will say that when, when I look at Europe, when I look at the Asian countries, they're aggressively uh, looking at accommodating policies uh, uh, for batteries at, at both ends, the production end and the back end. And I really do not see that level of focus attention in the United States. Right. And, and, and so are there models here, you know, in a, in a U.S. context that you've seen? I mean, you've, you, you go back in the energy and environmental policy area for a long time and, you know, we're, we, we have not touched on your, um, experiences in the EPA, which I'm sure are, are interesting <laughs> and um, you have a rich history there. Um, but is there a way that maybe the U.S. with its unique um, uh, model and relationship between government and business, right, which is what I think a lot of this effort that you're involved with is about, is about public and public-private partnerships. Is there a way that we can adopt that kind of positive, proactive um, oversight of how um, batteries are implemented without the very strong kind of government um, direction that I think people in the states here are not crazy about. I know that's a long question, but um, in mentioning Europe and in mentioning Asia and the models, I think from from uh, you know from my personal perspective, and I think a lot of people here in the states, we want to do the right thing without 
a lot of government direction. Is that possible? And that we'll probably end here, Maddie, with one of the most difficult questions. Apologize for that. Well, I, I would say there are multiple dimensions to this issue, right? So uh, if you look at the long history of uh, uh, nudging the market, nudging the independent uh, uh, energy producer market, you know, there are, there's been a lot of pitfalls in that. Uh, but, but I do think that uh, the independent systems operator, uh, which has looked at um, cross-border flow of energy, uh, um, and you know, and you have these regional consortiums that exist. I mean, in a sense, you have these uh, both state and regional structures which are very much aligned with and attuned with the market of energy. Right. Um, I do think that's a great structure to then look at, well, how do we then integrate uh, the considerations of battery deployment? Right. And and so, uh, you know, and and so some may be more receptive than others because some have also linked that with greenhouse gas reductions, for example. But I do think that that structure lends itself to looking at what are the highest priority actions to to nudge the market to uh, look at deployment of batteries at a higher scale? Right, right, and that's your point. Now is the inflection point in some respects in that in that policy and market um, context. And it, and it sounds like you're thinking about leveraging off of the current in place structures. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. Well, Maddie, there's so much more we could talk about. I, I don't want to take up your whole day, and, and we really appreciate um, your uh, really appreciate your uh, involvement. We want to, I want to leave you with one last question, if possible. And um, you started off as a chemical engineer um, and became an energy lawyer, and, and um, of course, that's a subject we're very interested in. How did you escape becoming an energy lawyer? How did you How did you get out of the? Because <laughs> the rest of us want to know how we can get out of this gig. So. Yes, if you have any, if you have any suggestions. <laughs> well, you know, uh, I, I guess my trajectory uh, has been where you know, ha- serving uh, uh, at a law firm. I was also always interested in the the nexus between the private sector and the public sector, and how do you align? Um, you know, the private sector and market-driven objectives uh, with uh, policy objectives, you know, and partly it's substance, but partly it's process, right? It's partly it's, it's trust building, you know, and I did a lot of work, you know, I know this, it's, maybe it's an overused terminology, but maybe it's more apt today than ever. Um, I, I think that, and the private sector, um not enough pre-competitive conversation goes on, you know, partly to do to people like you who give uh, overtly restrictive guidance on antitrust. <laughs> uh, but but I do think in solving both the opportunity and the problem of the future, more pre-competitive conversation is necessary. But then if you build on that pre-competitive conversation, how do you then engage with governments to, I would say, co-design uh, policy solutions that either enables the market or prevents a problem, but does it in a way that doesn't um, restrict the market. So I would say that is something that I think more attention is necessary. And it's kind of where I've spent uh, a large part of my career in trying to figure out. <laughs> well, I think one of the things that to me is is your career highlights. Um, I saw one of, the, one of the points that came out of the World Economic Forum's last uh, meeting was the importance of education and lifelong education and also stepping out of your comfort zone. And, and we tend to preach that here um, about how important it is to step out of your comfort zone and see the connections between various different kinds of markets, uh, the way externalities work. Um, and that's one of the reasons why I think, quite frankly, we wanted to bring you on was that um, folks in our business tend to look at batteries just in terms of the project development aspects, the regulatory aspects. And I think that I at least was um, heartened to see World Economic Forum's statement that customer involvement and lifelong education, stepping out of your 
comfort zone is really one of the keys to to the future in terms of um, you know how we reach the goals that Global Battery Alliance um, has set out. Yeah, thank you, Maddie, for for joining us, and um, and we would love to have you back in September for a quick hit if you want to give us a overview on the um, roadmap. Thank you very much, sir. All right. Take care. These recorded materials are designed for educational purposes only. This podcast is not legal advice and does not create an attorney-client relationship. The views and opinions expressed in this podcast are solely those of the individual participants. Troutman Sanders does not make any representations or warranties, expressed or implied, regarding the contents of this podcast. Information on previous case results does not guarantee a similar future result. Users of this podcast may save and use the podcast only for personal and other non-commercial educational purposes. No other use, including without limitation, reproduction, retransmission, or or editing of this podcast may be made without the prior written permission of Troutman Sanders.